Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And you already know, as always, first I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. Now in today's part 45, we will talk about a very famous theorem, namely Taylor's theorem. This one is very important for a lot of applications and you might have already heard the term Taylor polynomial. In fact, the overall idea here is not hard to understand because it's about an approximation method. Therefore, what you should imagine here is the graph of a function that is a few times differentiable. And then one will fix one point in the domain and as often it's called x0. Now around this point one wants a local approximation for the function. And for this reason this point x0 is often called the expansion point. Ok, now I already told you we want an approximation around this point and this should be given by a polynomial. In fact, you already know the simplest one given by the tangent. Please recall, this is the linear approximation we introduced in the definition of the derivative. In other words, here we have a polynomial with degree 1. Indeed, now Taylor's theorem generalizes this fact to polynomials with higher degrees. Hence, in the picture with the next step, we would have a parabola. And in the same way as the tangent was the best linear approximation, this parabola should be the best quadratic approximation. Now, what this exactly means, we have to describe with a formula. Therefore, let's first recall the best linear approximation we defined with the derivative. In order to do this, we will introduce a new variable we call h, which should be a small number we add to x0. In this sense, the point x0 plus h will be our point x. Indeed, often this h makes the whole formulation a little bit simpler. Now what we find by the definition of the derivative is that f of x0 plus h is given by f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times h plus a remainder term r of h times h. Now here when you compare to our original definition of the derivative, you see that h now plays the role of x minus x0. Hence in this formulation, the linear term here is easy to recognize. Ok, now one important property missing here is that r of h goes to 0 when h goes to 0. In fact, this is the property that makes the tangent the best linear approximation. Ok, now maybe not so surprising, in a similar way we can write down a quadratic approximation. Of course, the linear term here should not change, but now we want to add a term with h squared. And as we will see soon, the best quadratic approximation is then given with 1 half times f prime prime of x0 times h squared. And in a similar way as before, we have a remainder term, which is not the same, but we still call it r. But now we have it here with h squared. Moreover, please don't forget that speaking of an approximation, this still means that this function r goes to 0 when h goes to 0. Ok, and now it might not surprise you that we can generalize this approximation to polynomials with higher degree when we have enough derivatives. And exactly this idea leads to Taylor's theorem. Therefore, let's formulate it. So the only thing we need is a function defined on an interval i. Hence, let's call it f as before. Now we already know we need enough derivatives, therefore let's assume that the function f is n plus 1 times differentiable. The reason why this plus 1 is helpful you will see in a minute. Ok, and as before we also fix an expansion point x0. Now the claim here is that for any number h we have such an approximation formula. Namely, this means that we take any h from the real number line such that x0 plus h still lies in i. This is important because only then we can put this number into the function f. Hence in this case f of x0 plus h is given as a whole sum of all the derivatives of the function f at the point x0. So please keep in mind this is a real number and we divide it by k factorial. 
Okay, so here you should see we start with k is equal to 0, which is just a function f at the point x0. And then we go through all the derivatives until we reach the nth one. Also, you should note that we don't see the k factorial at the first two terms here. Because for k is equal to 0 and k is equal to 1, we just get the factor 1. However, at k is equal to 2, we see 1 half. And this means the next factor will be 1 sixth. Okay, now you might ask how this factor comes in, and I can tell you we will see it in the proof soon. However, more importantly here, I should tell you that we also have our variable h in, namely with h to the power k. Hence what we get here is indeed a polynomial with degree at most n. And as we have seen before, we also have a remainder term at the end. And this one I just want to denote with a capital R. And in addition, it gets an index n. Of course, the whole remainder term also depends on x0, but for us, mainly the functional relation to h is important. Therefore, you see, we often just say rn of h for the whole remainder term. However, the more important part is the front part, so the whole polynomial. In fact, this one is called the Taylor polynomial, or more concretely, the nth order Taylor polynomial. Okay, now the whole claim here is not finished yet, because, of course, as before, we can say something about the remainder term here. Indeed, the remainder term gets better when we have one derivative more than we need for the Taylor polynomial. From this, it follows that we find an intermediate point we call C. This is a lowercase Greek letter, also often called Xi. Now the important part is that this number lies in between x0 and x0 plus h. This means that if we want to write this as an interval, we have to distinguish two cases. It just depends which of the two numbers here is bigger than the other one. So we don't know the exact value of the number xi here, but we know the range of it. However, often this is enough for an estimate of the remainder term rn of h. And in fact, the formula for the remainder term is so easy to remember because it looks exactly like the last term in the Taylor polynomial. More concretely, the number of the derivative is n plus 1 and we divide by n plus 1 factorial. In addition, at the end, we have h to the power n plus 1. However, we find the difference, and this is the only one, we don't evaluate the function at the point x0, but now at the point xi. Okay, there we have it. This whole thing is the famous Taylor formula, which holds for every function f, which is often enough differentiable. And maybe I should tell you, sometimes you also see it in a different form. This happens when one is interested in the Taylor polynomial, but not in the explicit calculation for the remainder term. Then one just writes plus big O of h to the power n plus 1. It just reminds us that here in the remainder term, h occurs with the power n plus 1. But we don't care how big the constant here is. Now, this curved O here is what we call a Landau symbol. And at the moment, we just use it as a shortcut for the whole remainder term here. However, later I will tell you a little bit more about this symbol and related ones. Okay, now for the end of the theorem, let me show you once again another formulation for this formula here. This happens if you don't want to use the variable h, but rather just the point x in the interval i. Then, of course, all the constants are the same, but now we have the factor x minus x0. And obviously, we also need the power k here. So now you see, there is no difference at all, it just depends which variables you want to use in your problem. However, here please note, both things, either with variable h or with variable x, are called the nth order Taylor polynomial. Okay. Then I would say, in the next videos, we can discuss examples, applications, and also the proof of this nice theorem here. Therefore, I hope I see you there, and have a nice day. Bye.